So um, once again, um, thanks everyone for joining. Um, I'm your host. I think most of you are looking at the, uh, the attendees list today. Most of you know me. Um, I'm Keir Bowden. I'm the CTR BrightGen. I'm a Salesforce CTA, MVP Hall of Fame. Um, if you want to connect with me on Twitter or LinkedIn, um, those are my details. Um, and this is the first of a series of webinars. Um, we didn't badge it as a series of webinars initially because we thought there was only going to be one. But um, starting to go through the amount of content there is, the amount of change that's coming along, this is going to be the first in our series. So we'll be talking about the, uh, the next one to come up um, later on today. Um, but what we'll cover today is um, what you should be doing right now, um, the concepts of responsible artificial intelligence, um, the technology that you'll be using, what you should be doing with your people to prepare them for artificial intelligence, um, and yeah, now what? What next? Any Deep Purple fans here will recognize that album reference. Okay, so what should you be doing right now? Um, firstly, let's throw a few numbers in, our survey said. So you might be here because generative AI is currently extremely popular um, and you've got FOMO, fear of missing out. Um, and you're not wrong. If you look at the time to 1 million users, um, ChatGBT in five days um, is in orders of magnitude faster than anything else we've had in the past. You know, Netflix took over three years. Even the social media giants like Twitter and Facebook still took years or months. Instagram, which grew um, like wildfire, um, only took two and, a, two and a half months to get to a million users. Yet ChatGPT did it in five days. Um, one word of caution, I'd say, is Threads did that in one hour. And that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be a game changer in the enterprise software space. Um, so yeah, that's a it's a good thing. It does seem to be really popular, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's um, it's going to stick around forever. Um, you might be here because your customers are asking you about it. Um, consumers love AI. It appears seventy three percent of them trust content produced by generative AI. I think it's quite remarkable, um, given that an awful lot of the uh, purveyors of generative AI say you shouldn't trust it. And I think that's because it does seem like magic. The, the way you can talk to it like a human, it can respond like a human, and it responds in a very confident fashion. Um, it really sounds like it knows what it's talking about. Um, so, you know, people do trust that. Even though 51% say they're aware of the latest AI trends, you know, an awful lot of them still trust. What's also interesting is there's a fair amount of them that aren't worried about. Um, uh, you know, what it could be used for um, in terms of evil rather than good. So, you know, 34% are worried about use in phishing attacks. That means 66 really aren't, um, which again, find that quite interesting. Um, so lots of trust and not too much concern about how it might be used for evil. Um, I think it's uh, entirely possible these views will change when we get the first Cambridge Analytica style scandal involving generative AI. But at the moment, it just all seems really good. It's really cool. Um, it's a it's a lovely human like experience and I can just ask it questions and it knows stuff. It's brilliant. Um, you'll notice for each of these um, slides, uh, I've got links at the bottom as to where the information came from. Don't worry about trying to capture any of that. We'll share the uh, the deck and the recording out as usual at the end after, after the webinar is complete. Um, so what do IT leadership think of it? Well, senior IT leadership are very keen. Again, 67 percent prioritizing it within the next 18 months. 33% um, consider it to be a top priority. So, you know, it's it's important, but it's a midterm thing for a lot of people rather than an immediate thing, probably because they think that a lot of this stuff doesn't really exist in a usable uh, format for enterprise um, companies. 33% um, believe it to be overhyped, um, but 80% of those who believe it is overhyped still believe it will help. So most IT leadership, even if they think it's being blown out of all proportion, still think it's actually going to be an improvement, it's probably just not going to be the game changer that everybody else thinks it will. Flip side to this is 71% believe it will introduce new security risks, and they are not wrong. 66% um, believe their employees don't have the skills, so that's a bit concerning. A um, lot, uh, lot of work to do to change that belief. Um, and 99%, so almost all of them, believe they must do something, um, but not all of them know what they should be doing. So, if you're looking at numbers like these and wanting in, what should your first steps be? If you haven't done this already, the first thing you need to do is get control of what's going on within your organization at this moment in time. Put someone, put a group in charge and make it clear who is in charge. 
because if you haven't communicated who's in charge then everybody thinks they're in charge they'll all be doing their own thing it'll be the wild west out there um, and then you've got to try and get control back afterwards which is really hard um, if, you know if you haven't um, put someone in charge if you haven't put any guidelines in place then once you start digging i'm sure you'll find that actually you've been using it without knowing with all the attendant risks etc um, make it clear who is accountable and responsible for you or use of generative it how it's used where it's used um, doesn't need as i say it doesn't need to be an individual but make it clear for the rest of the organization who it is what it is so they know where to go if they want to do something or if something goes wrong um, you want to publish guidelines to tell your staff what they can and cannot do with generative ai most importantly remind them of their responsibilities around corporate data cannot stress that enough you'll be hearing that from all directions certainly in the salesforce world is you know the data is sacrosanct you've got to make sure that you're not handing it over to the wrong places and make sure that where you're using data with generative ai it's appropriate data you're not just handing over the keys to the kingdom um you know tell them tell tell your staff what the acceptable use cases are which areas of the business it's appropriate to use and which it isn't you probably don't want to turn it on for everything you want to look at some use cases and roll them out um where do they go for approval if they want to do this um and also you know tell them where what training they should be taking encourage them to take training but identify what it is make good use of their time um but most importantly you want to collaborate encourage collaboration on this topic you want questions you want concerns you want ideas you just want control over that so that you know what's happening. So um, a question to ask yourself, and this, this um, little picture here is one that I grabbed at the Salesforce World Tour, um, and it's something I referred to in, a, in the first blog post that we did on AI. Um, AI has been around for nearly 10 years in Salesforce World, and it's been usable for probably seven years in Salesforce World. So if you're not already using that, what's the difference? Why is generative AI suddenly a game changer for you, um, aside from, um, that it's in the news and everyone's really keen on it. You know, if, if, if AI for classification, for discrimination, for next best, next best action, that kind of thing, if that didn't add any value, what value is generative AI adding um, to you? So make sure you're making the decision for the correct reasons. You're not just knee jerk saying, everyone's really keen on this generative AI, we need in as well, let's just do it. Let's not think about it, let's just jump in with both feet. Um, and if you think you should be using it, what's your use case? You know, identify a use case. You want some low hanging fruit, something which is going to be relatively easy to plug generative AI into or to plug into generative AI. Um, but if you, when you do this, you want to identify what success looks like. It's no good just going in, getting to the end of it, spending a couple of hundred grand. Do we succeed? Who knows? Um, does everyone seem happy? Yeah, customers seem as happy as they were. Do we know if they're any happier? Not really. Um, if you're not if you don't know what success looks like, you don't know whether you've been successful, you'll have a very hard job getting further investment. And part of this is identifying what you'll measure. How do you know you're getting better or worse? What's changing? So identify that kind of thing up front before you start getting involved in this. Um, as usual, it's all about the data. Doesn't matter how fancy schmancy your algorithms are, if the data isn't good, the generated content won't be good either. So quality data beats these algorithms into a cocked hat. If you've got quality in, you'll get quality out. If garbage goes in, garbage comes out. Same as it always was. And this is the kind of thing you ought to be doing at the moment because it will pay dividends even if you don't go the generative AI route. If you've got you know, incomplete missing fields, you've got the wrong data, it's purely inaccurate, you've got multiple copies of the same information in different fields, you've got redundancy in there, or you've got information that there's no point in having and no need to have, that's gonna skew the model. So the call to action here is very simple. You know, fix your data, modify what's wrong, replace um, if you've got um, inaccurate data and delete it if you don't need it anymore. Um, by doing this, you know, you'll be in a much better place anyway, even if you decide not to go the generative AI route. So the other aspect of examining your data is how much you have and how much you should use. So we've never really cared about that in this industry before. We've always wanted as much data as we can possibly get. The thing is, we have got an awful lot of data now, um, and some of it isn't really relevant because it all happened a while. It, you know, it's all gathered a while ago and may not reflect um, the current situation. I'll talk a, bit, a little bit more about that in another area later on. Um, but basically, if you've got too much or too little, that can cause you issues. So if you've got too little data, you are, you're potentially exposed to one of two types of fitting. So underfitting is where you've got a really simplistic model 
um, and it's it's very binary in its view. It's unable to detect any nuance because all of the training data you've given it, all of the data you've handed over has just been very binary in its own way. It's been very kind of yes or no, rather than realizing there is actually a scale of, of, of values um, between yes and no. It's just you've never encountered those um, in your work with customers, etc. So basically, yeah, it, when it's underfit, your model is is too simple. You give it real data, it can't see real patterns because it's only looking for really obvious things. Um, on the other hand, if you've got too little data, you might also um, be at risk of overfitting. And what this means is that because there's so little training data, the model is very finely attuned to that training data and it can't apply, it hasn't detected any patterns, it hasn't you know, figured out any rules for itself that can be applied to real data. So essentially in human terms, what it's done is rather than learning and rather than reasoning about that training data, it's just memorized it. So everything looks like that training data to it because that's all it's memorized. Every response is rooted in that. Um, you also, a bit Goldilocks style, you don't want too little data, but you also don't want too much data. Um, if you've got too much data, you can have concept drift, which is what I was saying, that it's no longer relevant. It was, you know, it's old and out of date information. The way you were doing things 10, 15 years ago may not be appropriate now in terms of providing the best experience for the customer. Um, the Curse of Dimensionality, I think, is a great name. That would be a great title for an autobiography, I think. Um, what this means is that you've included irrelevant data and the, um, the model has spotted patterns in it. So to give you a really ridiculous example of this, if you were trying to identify customers that might be interested in a new product, and part of the data used to train the model was their swimming proficiency, um, the model may decide that there's a rule that means it's only worth pitching to those with the 200 meter butterfly ribbon. Um, clearly nonsense, but this is what happens when you put irrelative, irrelevant data in there. Um, the other thing you might get is uh, data saturation, where you have all the possible combinations present in your training data. So adding more is just putting, you know, adding additional cost, additional effort to training the model, and you're not actually giving it any new data, you're just giving it repetitive data. Um, and probably the biggest issue when you use new data for AI is bias. And we'll talk about that in a bit of detail shortly. Um, so if you're gonna use AI, you need to make sure that you're using it responsibly. I think most, most people agree with that. So I don't know if we've got any Silicon Valley, I've already asked about Deep Purple, so if we've got any Silicon Valley fans on the call as well. Um, even Gavin Belson realized that we need ethics in tech, Tefix as he called them. Now, of course, he was using them for evil, whereas we will be using them for good to give everybody the best possible experience. Um, so the first aspect of ethical AI use is around trust. AI generates answers that sound really good, um, but it's building these based on training data and patterns. Um, it's not, you know, it's not genuinely making that up. Essentially, what it's doing is it's responding that questions like the one you ask typically have answers like the one I've just made up. Um, and this is probably one of the reasons that consumers like it. You know, it sounds really confident, it sounds really plausible, and for simple things, um, it does, you know, get it right a lot of the time. Um, but you should treat all answers as tainted. Basically, all answers are guilty until proven innocent. So even Sam Altman, CEO of OpenAI, he agrees with this. Um, what does he say here? ChatGBT is incredibly limited, but good enough at some things to create a misleading impression of greatness. It's a mistake to be relying on it for anything important right now. It's a preview of progress. We have lots of work to do on robustness and truthfulness. So I think there's probably an element of covering themselves there. You know, if you, if you caveat emptor, use it at your own risk. But I think it's really good to keep in mind that this is the creator of it is saying, you know, treat it with caution. So, you know, don't take the AI, as a, a, AI at its word ask it to explain its work. If it provides, if you ask it to provide citations and references and it gives you those, make sure they exist. Again, don't take them at its word, make sure they exist and make sure they are relevant to the question that you asked, not something that it's just made up or you know, picked something which isn't relevant. Um, you want a clear explanation of how the AI tools you're using works, work rather, and you wanna share that with your stakeholders so they can decide if they're happy with it. You know, this this is not a situation where you can say, well, the computer came up with a decision, no, but we don't really know why. Um, that's not going to fly. You've got to be prepared to explain the decision. Um, that it, you know, a no is a genuinely reasonable decision and a human would have arrived at exactly the same conclusion. Um, and in order to build trust with the various groups involved, you've got to encourage them to engage with you to understand how the tools work under the hood. You know, why using them is a good thing 
for you and for them, how this will improve their experience, and also allow them to have a say in how you use the tools. You know, they're bringing their unique perspective in. You want to leverage that. They can be providing you with information to shape the future. So your next core ethical value, transparency. And this is a, this is a great quote from the European Commission. Humans need to be aware that they are interacting with an AI system and must be informed of the system's capabilities and limitations. Um, and what that means is if you are using AI as part of your business, you need to publish that information, both internally and externally. People need to know where that is being used. Um, the next bit should be no great surprise if you're familiar with GDPR. Um, so in this country, in, uh, sorry, in the United Kingdom, it shouldn't be an issue. But if you're planning on using an individual's data to train AI models, you need to tell them that and you need to allow them to decline to participate in that. Um, and you also need to be transparent about how the AI model you are using works, you know, what it can and can't do, strengths and weaknesses, how it can be affected if there's bias in the data. If you don't publish this, people will think you're hiding it and then everyone will assume there's a reason why you're hiding it and then you've got a load of work to do to convince them there is actually nothing wrong at all. But if you also say, we don't really know how it works, but it is making key decisions for us, that's unlikely to go down overly well with your customers as well. So I said we'd come to it later and here we are, bias. This is probably the biggest um, area of ethics to consider. Um, bias, you know, you can consider that as fairness. Is everyone being treated equally? Or as data science put it, are we sure that the absence of prejudice or preference for an individual or group based on their characteristics is a feature of our data? So the first thing you need to do is define what fair means to your organization. If you don't have that, if you don't have those standards, then it's hard to know if you're achieving that fairness. Um, you need to look at your data and weed out any bias. And by bias, we mean that certain elements have a disproportionate effect on the results because they are weighted heavily or they feature too frequently um, in the data. And if you don't weed out the data, uh, the bias, you'll get skewed outcomes. Your reasoning won't be sound, your decisions can't be justified. Um, you'll get low accuracy because the decisions aren't being made on the attributes that matter, they're being made on the biased attributes. And worst of all, you'll be introducing or reinforcing systematic prejudice. Um, there are many types of bias. Uh, we're I'm going to cover a few of these that are kind of re particularly relevant with generative API, but I'd very much advise you do your own research too. Um, historical bias. This is where there's already a preference or prejudice present in the data based on decisions or processes that you've enacted in the past. This is in your data already, and it reflects the bias you're already showing, even though you may not have realized any of this. It typically reflects the social inequities that were present in society over the years you've been doing business and over the years you've been capturing data, but it gets amplified by um, artificial intelligence and machine learning. Um, the one upside is that the learning um, often amplifies it to the point that it's really obvious and to everybody and you think, how on earth did we get here? Um, an example of this is Amazon's CV screening project in 2014. Um, this used 10 years of historic data about successful candidates to screen current candidates. Uh, because of historical attitudes, most of the people hired during those 10 years were male, and almost all of the technical employees were um, male. Um, the model saw this was a strong pattern and flagged men as suitable candidates over women. Now, this wasn't just based on gender that was identified in the data, etc. It was picking up phrases in CVs like captain the women's lacrosse team. Um, but it, you know, it was still um, obviously incredibly biased and not very useful at all. So this had to be scrapped in 2015, but here we are eight years later still talking about it. So you know, it takes a while to get away from that. Um, next, we have selection bias. Um, so this is, this is basically also known as representational sample bias. And what this means is your data is not representative of the population you intend to serve. So for example, if you're launching a global service, which is intended to be used by everyone around the world and provide exactly the same experience, but you trained it purely on data from residents of San Francisco, then you're gonna find the results probably aren't gonna be overly relevant to someone living in rural England. Um, can also mean that your sample set isn't randomized. You actually have a sample set that reflects the whole world, but you just picked a specific section of it, which happened to coincide with you uploading a load of data that had been captured from San Francisco. Or it means, potentially that you asked for volunteers and then you didn't spot that it was all pretty much the same people volunteering. Um, and an example of this that's going on at the moment is the current NHS uh, Nottingham maternity inquiry. So um, 
in order to get uh, to, to for people to opt in to um, uh, be involved in the inquiry, um, they had to opt in, um, and letters were sent to everyone that had used the service and might have had a bad experience. Um, however, they were all written in English and they used technical legal language. What this meant was you got 250 white respondents and 20 black and Asian respondents, which was in no way representative of the affected group of the total population. Um, but at the time, nobody saw anything wrong with this. You know, English was easy to send out. They needed the technical legal language to cover themselves, um, but they very much ended up with a selection bias there. And it was, you know, that was gonna give them huge problems with the data. Um, implicit bias. So this is a, a little bit less around what's in your data and a bit more around how you use your data. Um, where humans are having a direct impact without really being aware of it. So this means the model is reflecting the opinions of the trainer. Um, there's a few subcategories to this, um, but the common ones are confirmation bias, where the data is used in a particular way, you process the data in a particular way to confirm your existing views. I think lots of humans are subject to confirmation bias, even if they convince themselves that it's because I'm right and I should be using confirmation bias because my views are correct. Um, and the second is where the model arrives at the same views as the trainer, um, because the trainer has kept asking it to try and try again until it liked the output. So this is known as the experimenter's bias. Um, an example of uh, implicit bias is, is in training a model to detect positive sentiment. So for a European trainer, um, thumbs up me positive. So they'll keep working the model until the model recognizes that thumbs up is positive, which is true for large parts of the world. However, in parts of West Africa or the Middle East, um, it's a very offensive gesture. So actually that wouldn't be very good at all. So the implicit bias has made that a model that can only be used in certain areas because it's reflecting the narrow views of the trainer. For aggregation bias, this is a bit less obvious. So in this case, you're taking a one size fits all approach to your model. Um, but that means it's going to draw incorrect conclusions. Essentially, you're grouping data together that should be treated separately. They're not the same category. So this, mean, this typically means your, categorize, your categories are too broad. You're categorizing data that doesn't really belong together in the same place. Um, an example of this would be if you're modeling what happens to people's salaries as their length of service, as their experience progresses. In many professions, your salary will go up as your experience increases, either by cost of living bumps, uh, bigger increases around promotions. For Premier League footballers, for example, that isn't true. They'll likely start off on a very small youth contract, um, potentially see some huge increases if they hit the big time. And then once they start approaching their 30s, it will start dropping off again. And then highly likely by sort of 33, 34, they're all done. But if you aggregate and categorize other professions and Premier League footballers, um, your model will be biased against the, the Premier League footballers because it will it will show that they um, their um, compensation increases as as their length of as their experience increases as well, which isn't true. You know, bias against Premiership footballers, the forgotten minority. Let's not do that. So, how do you remove bias? Um, first thing to do is to make sure your model isn't including data that identifies protected characteristics uh, like gender, like race, like ethnicity. Um, also, uh, when you're asking for volunteers, make sure your communication methods give all potential participants an equal chance. Look for outliers that can materially change the data. Again, maybe you're doing you know, salaries in the southeast and you've got a few Premier, foot, Premier League footballers uh, slipping in there. That's going to skew everybody's salaries to look enormous because theirs are so large. They're such a huge outlier. So you probably don't want that data in there. Um, if you're using default values, check that you actually have got some real data on those fields because if 90 percent of your data is default values that you've picked that's not representing the real world that's representing a standard value that you've chosen may not be accurate at all um subject your data to internal and external review that's that's the key thing really when you're checking for bias make sure it's got lots of eyes on it um there are also tools and consultants that can help with this the flip side um a bit like the too much data too little data is don't over sanitize don't do too much fixing and filtering of this data because if, if you change too much it's no longer real data it's not reflecting the actual data it's reflecting some perfect world that you're trying to engineer so the insights that come out of that data aren't going to be helpful um, so moving away from bias next technical area to consider is hallucination so hallucination simply machine simply means the response from the model isn't supported by the training data 
Um, or what it actually means is we humans don't think the response from the model is supported by the training data. Maybe that the model has actually spotted a pattern that we humans can't because we can't deal with those volumes of data. So always double check this. Don't just assume that because you weren't expecting it, it's hallucinating. Um, the impact of hallucinations really depends on the context. So if I'm writing a blog on rugby tactics um, and I use ChatGPT to help me and it hallucinates that kicking back into your end goal area will help win games, all that means is a few more people will think I don't know what I'm talking about. If it's a medical diagnosis that isn't based on symptoms and it's just hallucinated something that the patient is suffering from, potentially catastrophic. Uh, mitigation for hallucinations, verify the answer. Simple as that, check it. Don't believe the, um, the response. The response is guilty until proven innocent. Um, and you can, you can help the, uh, in, improve the response and help avoid hallucination by writing good prompts, by narrowing the context. Um, ask it to explain why. Um, you know, ask it to, to give you um, uh, citations, to give you references. So a good example of somebody not verifying was uh, the lawyer Stephen Schwartz. This was in the news. So he used ChatGBT to help prepare for a lawsuit versus Avianca Airlines. Um, ChatGBT cited six cases to support his um, case. This looked good to him because it included references from main legal information services. Sadly, they did not exist and he hadn't checked them. Uh, the case did not go well and the judge was very displeased with him. He vexed the judge for sure. Um, Ethical use of AI also means it's safe and reliable. So as with any other data, you need to make sure your models, your inputs, your um, uh, data that's feeding the models are appropriately controlled. They're protected from attack, even if it's AI powered attack. So it's operating at a higher level than humans could be. You know, secure everything just like you would any other organizational data. Um, it has to be at least as, re as reliable as your existing systems. You know, it has to be able to scale, it has to be able to perform at the level they did. It, it may be generating the most fantastic insights, but if it can only handle a third of the load, that's not really helping you very much. Um, and it needs to be dependable. Um, even if it's under stress or attack, um, the response should be consistent and accurate. And if it does fail, like every other system, it should fail gracefully and predictably. It shouldn't just collapse in a heap. Um, an area where I think I've seen surprisingly little discussion today, it's occasionally called out, but not much, is that in order to be um, ethical use of AI, it needs to be sustainable use of AI. Um, <coughs> but again, not an awful lot of discussion. Now, most of the consumption takes place during the training. Maybe this is why it is. But if you're using a model and you're calculating your carbon footprint, you have to take some account of, of the fact that it's been trained for your use. So to train the GPT-3 model, these are estimates um, based on, uh, by, given by some experts, um, but it's estimated that it took the same amount of electricity that could power 360 homes in the UK for a year, and it used the same amount of water as 5,000 people would in a single day. So it's quite a significant impact. Um, the amount of CO2 is highly variable because it depends on where the training takes place. There's an area with a good mix of renewables, could be as low as 4,000 kilos of CO2, if it's primarily gold and coal and gas powered electricity, it could be as much as 200,000 kilos. Um, and a simple query uses around 10 to 20 mil of water and a tiny amount of electricity. However, if you're doing millions of these, the impact will stack up. And according to one Gartner study, if we don't come up with some sustainable AI practices, by 2025, it will consume more than the entire human workforce. So that'd be lovely, won't it? They'll have taken over and they'll be even worse than we are. Um, as a final takeaway on this subject, consider setting up an AI ethics board to define how you should be using AI ethically and to hold yourselves to account that you're living your values. Make sure there's a diverse membership to avoid our old friend bias and make sure you have executive buy-in so that the board is taken seriously. So the next couple of slides, I'm going to talk about the legal aspects you need to think about. Um, just in case any of you are wondering, I am not a lawyer and this is not legal advice. Always consult an expert. Um, first up, ownership. First thing to say is the legal implications are complex and uncertain. Um, regulation and legislation is lagging behind the tech and it doesn't look like it will change anytime soon. So who owns the generated content? Is it you? You wrote the prompt, do you own it? Does whoever developed the algorithms for the model own it? Whoever trained it, do they own it? Does the AI itself have ownership? Or does nobody own it so it's available for anyone to use? You can't own anything, you can't control anything. Um, going more, who knows? 
always read the terms of conditions of any generative AI service you're using, but bear in mind that is simply them clarifying their rights in respect to you. Generally speaking, what they're saying is it's all yours, it's nothing to do with us. That doesn't mean you own it if that's not what the, uh, the legal situation in your jurisdiction. So, you know, this is something to think about really. And if this is a concern, talk to some experts, get legal advice. Um, patents, patents is the reverse of ownership. So now we can come into infringement. If there is an infringement by the generated content, who is infringing? Is it the original author the model was trained on? Um, is it the trainer? Is it the operator? Is it the AI? Is it us using? Who knows? Um, and this, I think this second point is really interesting. This is Sean O'Brien from Yale Law School. So he sees a future where patent trolls use AI to generate huge amounts of code that they patent and remove under restrictive licenses. And then they sue anyone who has similar code, um, which I think is a really interesting concept. And I think it's a handy reminder that not everyone will be taking the same ethical approach. Um, and finally, on this topic, copyright in the US. Uh, if it, it needs to have substantial human involvement to be copyrightable. In the UK, it's a little bit more straightforward, but again, that's subject to interpretation. Um, does the copyright holder of the training data have any rights? Well, some legal experts think they might if it replicates their work and competes with them. Um, key thing here is to diligently document what was created by AI, what was helped by AI, how much help AI gave you. Make sure you capture this kind of information because otherwise you're gonna have a hard job proving that it's yours. And your reminder that the legal implications are complex and uncertain. And it feels like we'll only get clarity on this once some cases get in front of some judges and run the course of appeals, etc. Um, so now we've covered being good AI citizens, let's have a little bit of a talk about the technology. Um, starting with a, a short primer on some AI concepts. Um, GPT. GPT stands for Generative Pre-Trained Transformer. Generative because it creates new data, um, but that's based on existing data and all it's really doing under the hood is identifying patterns and predicting words. It's really good at predicting those words and it's really good at predicting a lot of them, so it kind of seems like it's a human, it can seem like it's a human talking to you. Um, the pre-trained aspect means it's been trained on an existing large data set. In the case of GPT 3.5, I think that was 170 billion um, parameters uh, uh, gathered by scraping the internet up to 2021. Um, and it'll be pre-trained, it'll be tuned for specific tasks. Um, GPT 3 is tuned to answer questions like a human. Um, and then you've got Transformer. Um, Transformer is a neural net architecture. It's really good at context. It's good at picking out which words matter when you give it a prompt. And it's also really good at parallelizing the um, processing of that prompt, um, which is why it's able to kind of generate fairly lengthy, confident, articulate replies pretty quickly. I mean, it's not that fast when you hit it through the API, but it's still pretty quick and pretty good. Um, taking a slight step back then to the beginning of artificial intelligence, machine learning. So machine learning is about learning from historic data and solving problems without having to write the solution to that problem. You're not writing the algorithm, you're not programming a solution to handle this particular data. The machine has looked at the data, it's figured out some patterns, it's figured out some rules. You can then ask it some questions and it can give you answers. And there are three types of machine learning. So supervised, which you can view like learning a sport with a coach, you know, humans giving you examples, they're labeling input, they're telling you how you did. Then you've got unsupervised learning, which would be akin to someone sitting and watching loads of games, footage, um, you know, watching loads of football maybe, identifying what seems to work and what doesn't, um, and then figuring it out from that. And then reinforcement um, would be having someone who's not coaching you, but they've got you know, a big bag of sweets, and you try various things, and when one of them works, they give you a sweet. So over time, you start realizing what things work, and learning those patterns and learning those rules. Um, typically, machine learning targets simple tasks, simple rule-based tasks, predicting an outcome, classifying data. It's all very yes-no. Um, artificial intelligence is still machine learning, but it's on steroids. So it's intended to simulate human intelligence, performing complex tasks rather than simple tasks. Um, it learns from the data, but it's also expected to reason about the data or apply logic um, to come to a conclusion. Um, and it is also self-correcting to improve, sometimes based on feedback. And it handles unstructured data. It doesn't need it to be fed in any particular structure. So GPT, 
predicts the next word in a sentence based on the words you provide it and the training data. And it appends that to the text, gets the first word in the answer, then it repeats that. It says, given this prompt and this first word, what would the next word be? And it just continues doing that. It does a really good job of it. Um, and if you look at the uh, the um, the document linked to the bottom there for Salesforce, that's um, I think that was a professor from one of the universities in the US explaining how this works as well. Um, so that's really good if you want to get a bit more into the detail. Um, next concept is large language model. Um, so this is a neural network. It's trying to mimic the brain. So each of those little circles is intended to be a neuron. Um, and a neuron in large learning um, equates to a parameter. Um, it's called large because it's got billions of parameter. That's where the large comes from. So when you put a prompt in, that gets converted to inputs, which are shown in orange. And they're all passed to every neuron in the next layer. Each neuron then carries out a calculation based on the inputs, based on some other factors it's been configured with. Um, and if the results of that calculation pass a threshold, it passes its value on to every other input in the next layer. If it doesn't pass the threshold, it doesn't. So the idea is this isn't an important input, therefore I can safely discard it. Um, and this makes its way through a number of layers and eventually it comes to the output layer, which are the results. Um, and then the best option from the results will be picked. Um, the layers between the input and the output are known as hidden layers. And if you have lots of those, it's known as a deep learning network. So yeah, none of, the, none of these, at this point, none of these concepts are particularly complicated. Once you get into what each of those neurons do, um, it gets very, very complicated. You need to be a lover of, of stats and maths to dig too far into that. Um, so that's general AI. Let's talk about some specifics of AI cloud. What we know, because it's still early days, even though um, I guess some people might have seen on Twitter and LinkedIn, Salesforce posting that sales and service GPT uh, went live today. Fairly narrow use cases, but still good to see that something's out there in the wild. So AI Cloud in its current incarnation is an assistant for every product. It's a tool that augments the, the performance of a human. Um, but bear in mind, you could be augmenting the performance of all your humans at the moment by hiring assistants for them. Um, you don't because it's expensive to hire two people to do one job. AI Cloud is also going to cost you money. It's going to cost you money in terms of Salesforce licenses, etc. Um, and if you're using, so if you are using something like GPT, you're still going to have to pay the cost of hitting the GPT API as well. Um, it sounds like Salesforce are going to, you know, the Salesforce license includes some level of credits, but depending on your usage, that may not last too long. <coughs> um, because it's an assistant provided by Salesforce doesn't mean you hand the ethics off to them. All of those ethical considerations that I called it earlier still apply, even if you didn't build the whole system from the ground up. Still your responsibility. Um, AI Cloud is human centered uh, in that a human is still in control and the AI is doing their bidding. They're the ones that sign off on it. Human makes the request, human reviews and adjusts the response to make sure it's accurate, make sure it's safe, make sure it aligns with the corporate values and then approves the sending of the response. So one of the things I've said before, and I think I put this in the first blog that I did, um, I still think the genius move from Salesforce was to position themselves as the trusted way to access AI, because there's an awful lot of nervousness out there, and they're helping to uh, calm some calm some people down. Um, so unless you've been under a rock, you'll probably have seen the Einstein GPT trust layer. There's a number of steps between the user making the prompt response, prompt request rather, and receiving the response. Um, and I'll talk about each of these a little bit on the next slide. Hopefully you can still read the diagram okay. Find it helps to have it there as I'm talking about the steps. The first step is secure data retrieval. Users who don't have access to data don't suddenly get access to data because the field is referenced in a prompt. Like that's a given. Um, you don't kind of forget about all your data protection because we can do something useful with that data. Um, Dynamic grounding is the next step. So this is but essentially providing contextual information specific to the use case of the prompt. Um, you know, for example, the detail about what the purpose of an email is, the target audience, the tone it should be written in. All of this you know, helps something like GPT produce a better response. If you think about it, GPT isn't trained on your data, your CRM data. It doesn't know anything about that. So if you don't give it additional information, it's going to come back with a very generic response, which will give you a good starting point, but you're probably going to have to do a fair bit on top of it. Um, data masking, very important. You, if you're going to send an email, it's really nice if it's personalized, um, but the AI doesn't need to see those personalization details. So those just get swapped out with patterns of a similar structure, but not reflecting the real data. 
and then when it comes back the patterns get swapped back with the real data again um, and uh, there's a little bit more information about how some of this stuff is going to work coming out from Salesforce as well. So it seems like some of the sensitive data rules that are currently used in Chatter, we're going to be able to apply those to prompts and there'll be some additional capabilities about being able to define, you know, what, what we should look for in a prompt, what should, you know, what should be identified as um, personal or company data that needs to be stripped out. So it's good to hear that, you know, this isn't just going to be a, a, a closed box. We're going to have quite a lot of control over this. Um, when the response comes back, it then gets checked for harmful or inappropriate contact. Again, content rather. Again, you know that can only go so far. Responsibility is still with you. Um, and details of the, you know, you've got an audit trail. Details of the request and the response, what you did, those are logged, and that's going to be really important. You know, if you get into things, things like ISO compliance audits about how your system works, how you're dealing with customers, and how you're sending, you know, how you're deciding to communicate with them. If it is, I, oh, we don't really know what we do, and we don't really log any information from it probably not going to go well for you. Um, and finally, the, the response goes back to the user, and that's where the user's um, experience, their critical thinking, their evaluation skills come in to look at it and say, actually, is this a good thing to be sending to our customers? Um, so all of which sounds great, right? So we can trust Salesforce. Um, yes, we can, but we should not blindly trust them. This is still on you, still on you and your custom, your company. You're still responsible, you're still accountable, so you need to make sure it satisfies your needs on top of the generic Salesforce checks. And you also need to understand how this trust layer works or you aren't demonstrating the ethical attribute of transparency. You know, you can't explain why it's taking the decisions because it's all Salesforce isn't going to help you. Um, once the trust layer has done its thing, for you, you've got to verify the accuracy. Mention that before, mention it again, always verify the accuracy. Um, Check what you've been given, don't just send it out. Make sure the recipient, anyone else who might be involved with this email, or the request that arise from it is aware that you used AI. This wasn't your entirely your own work. And remember, all actions are taken by humans. AI is assisting, but you're not just blindly pressing the button and trusting it. You, you or your staff make the decision to use what it has given you. Um, and also remember that you're dealing with models that learn based on usage. So you can't just check everything at the outset and assume it will remain stable um, and satisfactory after that, you've got to, you know, continually recheck those. This is not one and done. Um, and in a few specific scenarios, these are the kind of things you should be looking for. So I won't go through all of them, everyone can read, but if you're transcribing a call, essentially you're recording that call. So make sure everyone consents, make sure you send them a copy of it afterwards so they can be happy with it. Um, you know, there are, when you, when you use these things, there are a lot of responsibilities that fall on you. Um, summarizing case information. We've seen a lot of examples of that from Salesforce, but you need to make sure it's it's only including relevant stuff. There could be irrelevant information that the machine sees as something that was important in solving that case. It's up to a human to decide whether it is or not. Um, which brings us nicely on to people. And the first part of the people side of things is training. Um, there is a skills gap around AI, um, and that will likely be around for a while. So as you can see here, lots of people are worried because they don't know how to get the best of AI, but they think they're going to be fired because of that or because AI is going to take their job. Um, and you know, are they right to be? Are they right to be worried? Um, one of the quotes that's that's cropped up quite a bit is AI probably won't take your job, but somebody using AI better than you might take your job. So take from that what you will. If you look at who is currently using which which industries are currently using AI. Marketing has got pretty good penetration, so over 50%. Sales is down at 35, and service is down at 24. This doesn't surprise me. Marketing, messaging, you know, segmenting groups, that can be quite general. It doesn't matter if you if it's not 100% accurate. You kind of nudge people in a particular direction. If you're into service management, if somebody's got a problem and you tell them a solution, that needs to be precise. That needs to be right 100% of the time. It's no good just guessing at that. So I think as that's what you can see the kind of the left to right in terms of usage is about how much accuracy you need, how much precision versus creativity. Um, you're gonna need to train your staff to pick up some new skills. So you wanna give them some general concepts of machine learning and AI, because they may need to explain that to someone. They definitely need to know how a specific tool works, because they may be explaining that to a customer. Uh, they need to know what it's safe to use it for, what they can and can't do with it, um, and also what the risks are, what they should be looking out for. You know, what kind of, if it goes wrong, what would that look like, how do I spot it? Um, they need to know what good looks like in terms of output. They need to know, you know, be able to evaluate an entire response, not just looking for certain word and certain cherry picking. 
they'll no doubt have questions and concerns, or they may receive those from a customer. They need to know either how to handle them themselves or how to escalate them. Um, and keep training them um, that they never use real data to learn. They never use real data to play around with anything. Again, data is sacrosanct. It's, and one of the things with AI is it's really good at generating you fake data. So you should definitely use that instead. <coughs> However, it's not just about new skills. You need to make sure your existing skills base isn't eroded because this is still human centered, right? The humans still need to be able to do all the aspects of the job they currently do. They need to have the skills to engage with customers. They need to be experts in your products or how will you verify the AI got the answer correct? Some customers won't talk to a computer. Um, I have some relatives who would definitely not want to do that. They will do what press whatever they have to press to get hold of a human. Um, and as I mentioned before, they need to recognize accurate output and they need experience and expertise in your business to do that. Um, and the thing is, if this is viewed as an opportunity to get rid of the juniors, then where are the seniors gonna come from? You've gotta keep bringing people through and bringing them on. Um, they just won't be doing quite so much of the boilerplate boring work. So many of your colleagues are gonna be fearful of AI. Um, some are worried that AI means mass unemployment. Others think that it may not take all the jobs, but it will be mine. Um, but a common theme is that Increased efficiency means we'll cut some jobs. So if 85% of the people plus AI can do 100% of the job, will 15% of the people be made redundant? Um, most businesses will actually look to have those 100% of the people um, being more productive and increasing the amount of work they can do. So going up to 115, 120, 100 and whatever percent of the work. You know, most businesses want to grow rather than shrink, so they'll use this to grow themselves. Um, People are also going to be wondering, um, is it worth learning any of these technical skills? If AI is going to write the code or it's going to build me the flow or it's going to create the campaign, you know, is there any point in me having those skills myself? Um, and absolutely, because if you don't have those skills, how can you know whether what it's done is correct or not? Just means you're not doing the initial, the first drafts. These tools are helping us get past the prototyping, the early versions. You know, we're thinking at the higher level. Uh, is the solution it's given me scalable? Is it robust? Is it future proof? Um, this kind of you can view this as everybody always wanted to be an architect um, and it feels like they're getting the opportunity now. You know, you don't need to be worried about the low level stuff. The machine can do that work at that higher level. So um, because your staff are worried, you're going to need to reassure them. So you need to be minding them that AI is an assistant. It's not their superior. They don't have to do what it says. You know, it's creating early drafts. It's not signing off the final version. And it's not doing the creative work. It can do creative things, but they tend to be quite random. Um, and if, every, if you, everybody relies on AI for creative um, work, it's all going to look exactly the same. What, it's, what you should be using it for is the mundane, repetitive stuff, the initial versions, so your staff work at a higher level. Yeah, so your humans need to understand, they correct, they approve contact, content. So as I said before, this isn't less staff, it's the same staff doing more. And also remind them just because AI can replace humans doesn't mean it has to. This isn't like a, you know, a, a, a path that we're on that could, and nothing can ever change. And, not, you know, human, AI will be augmenting humans rather than replacing them is where a lot of people think it's going to go. Um, so what to do next? Well, next thing you should do is sign up for the next webinar, um, which will be on prompt engineering, um, which is a, a grand term for writing some English questions for uh, AI, but actually there is an awful lot to it. You know, it sounds really simple, but to get a quality response, again, you need to put a quality prompt in. Um, so if you scan the QR code there, um, it's on our website as well, at the short link shown, or you can find it if you just Google for it. But yeah, please come and join me in August. That'll be far less presentation and a lot more interactive work going on in things like the ChatGPT playground. Next thing to do is start learning. Um, there's a number of useful trail mixes on Trailhead around generative AI and ethics in general, which is, again, should always be top of mind. And if you fancy um, diving into the technology a little more, then deeplearning.ai has some really good short courses that only take a few hours, um, give you a playground where you're interacting with an API, um, and are really very cool. And also, if you missed the Salesforce webinar last night, uh, the Unlock ROI with generative AI and GPT, um, that is available on demand. Just register at the link shown and you can watch that. That was an interesting watch for sure. Um, and also start exploring, start playing around with it. You know, OpenAI and others have chatbots and APIs you can try out, um, some of which are paid, some of which require a free account. Um, Hugging Face, the one at the bottom, is a really cool um, platform. Um, it's a 
all manner of tools and models are available to try out. Um, you know, most of them are being hosted by somebody for free, running on minimal hardware, so they can be a bit slow and they do time out. Um, but all the ones I've tried have been very functional. Um, and finally, time for me to hold myself to my ethics and be transparent about my use of AI. Um, these images on the topic slides were all generated using Stable Diffusion 2.1 via Hugging Face. Um, and I'm terrible at drawing, so I could never have created these myself. Um, it also turns out I'm not very good at describing what I want an AI image generator to draw for me. Um, but I'm not bad at prompts for steampunk style images. Um, and I quite like the results, even if nobody else does. Um, so that brings me to the end of you listening to my pre-prepared content. Um, I hope that was useful. And I'm now going to go and see if we have any questions and hope that I might be able to answer them if we do. Uh, does survivorship bias play a part in artificial intelligence? Um, I think it's entirely possible that it could play a part in your um, in your data, because um, I think um, so. Survivorship bias for anyone who hasn't come across that. The, the classic example that's always given um, was looking at the the planes that returned from bombing missions in World War II um, and seeing where the bullet holes were and putting more armor around those, failing to realize that the, um, those that were coming back meant that being shot there didn't actually matter. It was all the places there were no bullet holes that meant that they were the fatal shots. So that's what you should have been looking at. Um, so I think, you, I think you could well have survivorship bias being reflected in the data. Um, and I think you'd kind of view that almost as um, self-selection type of bias as well. You'd look and you'd make, you're just going to have to analyze the data in terms of um, the approach to tackle it. It's all good. If you've got bias, it's always much easier to tackle it at the data level before you train the model. Once you train the model, um, while there are some techniques around tweaking the model, um, if you were going into something like ChatGPT from Salesforce, you wouldn't be able to get down to that level um, of tweaking it. So it's always look at the data first, always dig into the data first. Um, I'd like to understand what happens when you input data into an AI program. Does something like ChatGPT record what you input and is there a chance it gets regurgitated elsewhere? Um, <clears throat> so this is a great thing. So it's, um, there was, there was a, um, a, a report about um, a dinner conversation that Mark Benioff of Salesforce had had with um, the OpenAI CEO, with Sam Altman, where Sam Altman had produced a, um, a little 10 second video, uh, AI generated video of Mark Benioff saying something. And Mark Benef was saying, well, that's great. Where did you get, you know, how did you train it? Or how did you get that information to make it look like me? And he said, well, we don't know. It's somewhere in the model, but there's no, it's not like a cellular database. We can't just go in and find things. Um, and I think also AI, at the uh, Salesforce World Tour AI Day, Patrick Stokes gave a really good example of this, that as a human, when you see an apple, that does, you don't immediately look at it and go, oh, it's round, it's green, um, and then I'll narrow in on it and recognize, you just look at it and you know it's an apple. Somewhere in your brain, you're able to, to do the cogitation required to immediately identify that as an apple. And the AI is a bit like that. There's no one place where this is an apple image is stored. It's just based on reasoning of inputs, et cetera. Um, there is absolutely a chance it gets regurgitated elsewhere. So this is, in the terms and conditions, as certainly were last time I looked, of open AI, um, they were saying that while it will not exactly replicate the training data that it was given, it may um, generate something, create something which exactly replicates something else on the internet which it isn't privy to. So if you catch, um, if you get an output rather, they all say it's entirely down to you to do your plagiarism checks, to do your copyright checks and make sure it's okay for you to use that. They don't hold any rights on it, but it doesn't necessarily confer you rights to do everything with as well. Uh, can I please show the QR code for the August event? I certainly can. There it is again. Uh, okay, there's all the questions. There's nothing else in the chat as well. Um, so, well, thanks for those questions and thanks very much everyone for your attention. Hopefully I'll see you towards the end of August to learn a bit more about prompting these models. Um, thanks everyone, have a great rest of the day.